Today, I am very excited to have Eric Rose as our speaker for our workshop on customer discovery. Uh, this is an important part of the startup world. And a lot of people forget about that. And they try to short circuit it or they don't try to, they, they wait too late in the process to get it started and waste a lot of time, energy and resources. So without further ado, and without uh, going into too much detail on Eric, because I'm sure he'll do a good job of that himself and better than me, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Rose. And uh, thank you all for uh, participating and muting yourself. And Eric, you're on. Thank you so much. What I'd like to do today to get started before my talk is I'd like to do a little bit of market research with you all, if that's possible here. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is ask you to raise your virtual hand if you are familiar with the Lean Startup. Could you raise your virtual hands? If you, you go, if you could put them on the screen, that would be great if you can. If not, if, you can't, if you're not familiar with that, you can wave your hand. But if you have familiarity with the Lean Startup, that's great. Give you another minute. Looks like about 40%. Thank you, Joe, for your chat message. Okay, and if you go ahead and lower those hands, um, the next question I'd like to understand, are you familiar with including having done any customer discovery work? That is getting out of the building and doing customer interface interviews. Raise your virtual hand or your real hand or chat, something if you've actually done customer discovery interviews. That's great. Chris, thank you so much. Okay, you can lower those hands. So we've got about 40% or so on both, which is great. And then the last question is, once again, if you would uh, raise your hand if You've taken insights from the customer discovery work and created a product that you put into market, product or service. Have you actually put something into market based upon customer discovery? Okay, a smaller percentage, but still a nice percentage. So I appreciate that. Okay, everybody, thank you for that. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and walk you through the presentation. Um, I think we'll do a couple things. First of all, if you have a question that comes up directly relevant to a particular slide, uh, if you would raise your virtual hand, I'll keep an eye open for that. Actually, Len will because I'll be okay. And then Len just holler at me that we've got a question. And then yep. we'll break in and, and try to answer that and monitor the time. And then we'll pause specifically for a little discussion between the two segments of the talk first on customer discovery, the second on product market fit. All right, so here we go. So thank you again for having me here today, joining me today. We'll be talking about creating a product the market wants which is known as customer discovery and product market fit. And we'll be talking about how to ensure what I call fidelity between that which you discover from the market and that which you actually put into the market. There's often a lot that goes on between the research and what you ultimately commercialize and having checks and balances through the development process to ensure that there is that fidelity. And if there are deviations, you're going in eyes wide open. You're not inadvertently moving away from that which the market values the most. So we'll talk more about that. First and foremost, 35% of all new startups that fail fail because that startup delivers to the market something the market does not value. That's a pretty high percentage of the root cause of failures of startups. Now, this work came from 
the latest version, which was a couple of years ago now, uh, from CB Insights. CB Insights published a dozen reasons for why startups fail. This 35% number was at 42% about five or six years ago. So it appears as if startups are doing a better job now of customer discovery and product market fit, maybe even market testing or regional rollouts before they do a full commercialization, which I think is great. So with that, let me share a little bit about who am I and how do I get the pleasure of sitting here on Zoom and sharing some thoughts with you. My business is primarily a product innovation consultant. I work with startups to help them move new products from opportunity to market reality. I typically get in when it's early stage, but there may be uh, something such as a prototype, or it may be as late as a failed product where there wasn't perhaps adequate customer discovery and product market fit. And I'll be brought in to help a startup figure out either where they want to go or what went wrong and what to do about it. I'm an inventor with over 50 plus patents granted in my name and an entrepreneur. I've launched a couple businesses. One I closed and my consulting business is still active. I've been an educator since 2009, started with Pepperdine University, moved over to Loyola Marymount, did some teaching online in the online MBA program at Rice University. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Cal State Northridge and a guest lecturer and mentor at USC. I have an undergrad in product design, an MBA from Pepperdine. I'm a certified new product development professional, one of a couple thousand in the world who've ever been certified to take new products from opportunity to market reality. And I have over 35 years experience in new product innovation, getting in anywhere along the path from a head scratch to a field failure. What I'd like to do at the moment before we get into the details of customer <clears throat> discovery and product market fit is I'd like to talk to you about the process I use to teach new product innovation and what it takes to be successful. I believe that that boils down to three key steps in this order. First is marketability. In today's talk, we're going to be covering extensively this first key, that is marketability. Number two is technical feasibility, which doesn't just mean engineering, but it means can a product, and, and I typically talk in terms of physical product, but much of this is relevant for software or even services. Can this product be designed, developed, and commercialized at a cost where it's low enough so there's enough margin for everybody in the channel to make the margins they expect? I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with clients who believe that their product only needs to maybe make 30% on top of the product to be a success in the market, but they forget about distributors. They forget about kickbacks for co-promotional items or advertising or stocking fees at grocery stores. And they don't really understand that a target cost for the product and its, let's say, manufacturing costs needs to include so much more than their margin and maybe a retailer's margin. And lastly, protectability. So if you've gone through the due diligence, the research, the market testing to identify there really is a business with an opportunity and you can technically execute against it, you want to find a way to prevent knockoffs of your venture. Most of the time, that means you'd be creating a blanket of intellectual property. But it could also mean things like supplier exclusivity, where you may have a key component in your new product and you can get a supplier exclusive on that for a period of time. Or it may mean 
you have some other strategic partnership for distribution. There are a number of ways to create protectability. We won't be talking about that today, but I do want you to understand that these are the three keys to successful new products, and I recommend that these be followed in this order. So let's move on to today's talk in detail. The first half of the talk, we're going to be discussing customer discovery, specifically finding the right users, creating an interview guide, doing the interviews. Once those interviews are done, now it's time to take that content and to interpret the results of the research. From the results, create product insights. And then during development, as we spoke of this term fidelity, how is it that we manage the new product development project trade-offs so that we have that fidelity between what the market values and what ultimately gets commercialized? A few acknowledgments. A lot of the content, reference content, has come from Steve Blank and his protege, Eric Rees, founder of the Lean Startup Book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Steve Blank has a substantial amount of content online for free. If you or your colleagues are interested, you can find that at steveblank.com. And then lastly, I highly recommend this course. It's available for free through Udacity. The only thing you need to do is register for a free Udacity account. This course, a substantial portion of this course, was required reading and viewing for my students at Loyola Marymount University in the, in the entrepreneurship program for the course that I taught, product and business design. This slide deck will be available for distribution. I'll provide it to Len, and he can provide it to those that have attended or registered. So let's dig in. The first thing I'd like to do is share a brief video from Steve Blank. I've got it queued up. So give me a moment, please, while I stop the share and move over to a browser. All right. Let's take a look at the first step in customer discovery. You're going to be living this for the next couple of weeks if you're doing this for real. Phase one is you state your hypotheses and you draw the business model canvas. And again, you put the canvas on the wall, you and your team get around and uh, put up yellow stickies. But the next step is you get out of the building. You're going to test the problem. You're going to test your understanding of the customer's problem or need, and you're going to figure out how to build the prototype. The next thing is you're going to test the solution. And you're going to test the solution if you're on the web by building a uh, low fidelity and then a high fidelity prototype. And you're going to, again, test your understanding of the customer's needs and whether your solution matches it. And this match, again, is called product market fit. That's the holy grail for entrepreneurs. Am I building something that people can't get enough of or are just willing to open up their wallets and empty it in front of you to get their hands on? And the fourth phase in customer discovery is you verify or pivot. Do people agree that you're solving a high value problem or need? And do you understand your business model enough to start test selling, which is the next step in customer validation? Now, what's really depressing to most entrepreneurs is the answer most often the first time you go through this is heck no. You know, it's, and, and what's worse is, well, they kind of sort of like, well, kind of, sort of is not a startup. Kind of, sort of is people have been nice to you. The only time you know that you have something that's worth investing your time and money in is if people are literally trying to force their money on you or can't use your product even in its buggy, uninitialized form enough. This is what you're looking for. 
And if you haven't found it yet, that's why the customer development process is an iterative circle. It assumes you will be going through this multiple times. And when you finally, finally think you do have something that matches customer needs, you get to the next step, which is customer validation. Okay. I want to pause here for a moment and open it up. Is there any questions about the customer discovery process? Has anyone gone through this and had a... Dieting. Seriously, don't oh, bother sorry, dieting again, second. ever, because you don't... Have they had any challenges that they want to share that we can chat about? Anyone, please? Don't be shy, folks. Yeah, I mean, uh, for career day, Marty and I have gone through, uh, I think this is our second cycle through, and we've pivoted twice, and we're still searching for that perfect uh, fit. You know, we're getting, we feel like we're getting closer, but, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, wow, we love you, but we're, you know, there's a big gap between we love you and we want to write you a check. So, and let me just add something to it. The way that we started is that um, a superintendent said to us, if you build this, I will fund it. And he gave us a check for $35,000. And then we went to um, uh, a boys and girls club who said, um, you know, I'm finding that none of the people that I hire have a resume. And he gave us $7,500. So we thought that was spectacular, right? I mean, we didn't even have a product and we got that money and it built, we built that product on their dollar. And then, and that was two years ago. And since then, we've not been able to gain any traction, which makes zero sense to me. Do you feel like you are, um, looking for the right people? Are you clear about, we're going to talk about that next, but do you feel like you're clear about who your stakeholders in this process really are? Yeah, so, so in education, there are, it's not a single person. There are many stakeholders that, that are involved. Okay. And, and we have tested through all of the stakeholders and continue to do that. Well, but if we were 100 percent sure, we wouldn't be here. So we're here because we're not 100 percent sure. It'd be my pleasure to chat with you offline if you want to reach out. You know, we, we can will. we can belabor that for, belabor. Yes. We can review that further. Okay. Chris, how about you? You had your hand up. No, sure, Eric. Uh, I'm actually in a really interesting place right now. The name of my company is FanView, and think of FanView as like a LinkedIn for youth athletes. We make profiles that cover their entire uh, career. And then I've developed a wearable technology to program those onto NFC enabled uh, wristbands and um, chips on, on shirts. So P, all they have to, all the recruiter has to do is tap on there and they can see the entire kid's profile. And I built my initial proof of concept. I loved the uh, Lean Startup, by the way, that's a great book. And I just believed that when we started, that's the methodology we needed to go for. So I built my minimal viable product using WordPress, which it was buggy and had all sorts of problems, but I was able to leave, show it to the coaches. And one of the things that I discovered was that I originally thought that I would make my program targeted to the kids. But when I started working with the coaches and teams, I realized that the kids don't have any time for this at all but they are really happy to allow for other people to manage their profiles and careers for them and their brands and marketing. And so, like and point, should, Chris, Chris, do you feel like at this point you have sufficient product market fit or you're not there yet? Yeah, I am. And But one thing I realized was that my MVP uh, was, um, I used it, but it was super buggy and I built it on WordPress, which involved, you have to have a WordPress specialist to actually do anything. And I realized I was really confided. And so I just decided to throw all of that away and start again on Wix. And I started two days ago and what took me four years to build in WordPress, I've learned all the lessons on mistakes and now. And I had a call with my developers and to get 90% 90, 90 of what took me four years, it takes me two weeks. Like next forward. Thursday, they're like, yeah, we'll be done. 
I look forward to hearing more about it. Please feel free to reach out. That sounds like a great little uh, you LinkedIn post about Wix versus WordPress. Thank you. There was a question from Gigi or Comet. I don't see anything here about looking at who is already in the market. Well, we haven't got through everything yet, certainly. Uh, I'm going to come back now to my presentation. And Gigi, please uh, pop that up again if you feel like you haven't got that answer. So let me go back to the PowerPoint. Bear with me. And let's move on. So we are talking about finding the right users. And you know, we, we, we heard about payday, uh, or career day, excuse me. And so I'd like to come back to that more, but let's let's dig in a little bit. So identify your demographics. What are the personas? Um, I worked with one client who had a product in the, let's just call it the beach shelter market. And he had a number of different potential markets. It could be that there was the, during the week mom who took the kids to the beach. It could be the family on the weekend, uh, dad, the rest of the kids that maybe were older uh, and not uh, at home during the day, they came. Um, but it was also another market segment, which were the surfer dudes. And it was uh, discovered the surfer dudes put their keys for their car on top of their tire because they felt like that was the safest place. So what we learned is, in the end, through the research, there were really three sets of personas, uh, three different markets, and there could be a base product that was the platform and some unique modules or add-ons, if you will, such as a locking safe for the surfer dudes, um, based upon market segments. So I want you to keep in mind, when you're looking at the markets, you're looking at who are these people, how big are the markets, what's the growth rate of those markets, are they growing at a growing rate, how difficult is it to penetrate those markets, um, what are the ones that are easiest to move from concept to cash, and deeply understand these different segments so you can figure out which segments would be best to capitalize ideally with the least investment and the shortest period of time between concept and cash. So that starts to address an issue of finding users that might be near-term users versus long-term users. So if you've got a customer that might be out there, let's say three to five years, seven years out, might be a long-term customer, but their needs might actually be quite valuable to understand as you capture the near-term market, maybe one to three years, and how do you do that? So my recommendation is that when you're doing your research, you try to segment your customers in terms of uh, time frame to buy. Is it one to three years? Is it three plus years, et cetera? I think that would be very helpful as you're looking to find users to do the research with. Keep in mind there are a broad array of stakeholders. They can be key opinion leaders, people who are bloggers. There may be academics. There could be um, government officials who are involved. Uh, certainly retailers and distributors who are gatekeepers to getting your product on the shelf. Shareholders, if you've got a venture where shareholders themselves have particular expertise or they know people who have particular expertise, it's important to reach out to them as you're looking for the right users to interview. And if you have an ongoing venture already and you have revenue from product and you're trying to develop, let's say the next gen product, look at your customer service department, your repair department, the service um, and warranty department. What have they learned? And what does that mean to who you're going to be interviewing going forward? Maybe you actually interview them or you may end up finding that some of your existing customers are great people to interview based upon the records of customer service. So again, a very wide array of stakeholders that you can map out and decide who you're gonna to wanna to interview uh, as you do the research for your product. I wanna tell, okay. tell you a little story. This is about a product called GoSpeak. 
uh, developed about by me about 14 years ago. Um, finding the right users was a trick. A company out in Camarillo, California, was a tech company that made ultraviolet and radio frequency remote controls for digital projectors on an OEM basis. So their customers were Sony, Hitachi, Mitsubishi, and Focus, those folks that made digital projectors. But they wanted to grow their business outside the OEM market. So I asked them, who are their customers? How do we interview the right users? To which they said, they don't really know. They only know that the, they've been in the OEM business, but they didn't think beyond that. So my question really was, well, wait a minute. Who are the people that put that remote control in their hand in the end game? Who actually opens the wallet to buy that projector and then and ultimately gets the remote control in their hand? Well, it's teachers, trainers, sales executives, road warriors, marketing, keynote speakers, um, all of the people that have that remote control in their hand, those are the end users that we ultimately wanted to interview to figure out what other products might end up in their hand. So I found the National Speakers Association. I created a company advisory panel based on members from the National Speakers Association. I was able to do a focus group at their trade group, find out there were half a dozen new products that would reduce the anguish in their business so that they could be more productive and more profitable. And one product stood head and shoulders above the rest, and that was an ultra portable PA system. So when they go to a venue, they wanted to know that that public address system was fully interoperable with their laptop, they knew that it played their music, that it worked with whatever microphone they had, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, I went back to the CEO of the company, told him about all the interviewing. We took this product from rough concept into the market in under a year, only because we were able to use a strategic partner to do the design, the development, the prototyping, and the manufacturing for a $35,000 investment which turned out to be a multi-million dollar revenue stream. And the third generation product is available on the market today. So the reason I tell you this is, if you think there's an opportunity out there, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly in where you think you were going. It could be an adjacent market. Often I find adjacent markets do very well. Uh, maybe if you've got a slight pivot, and in this case, a strategic partner delivered the product solution because the company I was working with had no expertise in audio products and the remote, uh, the, excuse me, the wireless uh, radio frequency uh, lapel mic was from another third party provider, somebody that was commercially available. So I hope this gives you some insight into different ways that you can take your customer discovery research and insights and create new products and new revenue. Eric, I think the one thing I'd like to just reiterate here Please. is you're doing this before you built anything. And a lot of times uh, at the pre-accelerator, for instance, we'll get people who come to us who built something for a problem they think they have, but they haven't done any customer discovery or product fit yet. Right. And, and therein lies the challenge. Uh, because now time and resources are being used for a product that might not be relevant in the marketplace, even though they think it is. Right. So that's what I call bass backwards or the cart before the horse. Right. And that's why the three keys to successful new products, marketability first, then technical feasibility, building a prototype, and then protectability if there really is an opportunity to have a business and a product. Thank you for that, Len. I appreciate it. About 70% of the clients that walk in my door <clears throat> already have a prototype but don't have market research. Right. So let's talk about creating the interview guide. The interview guide is really about creating questions that are anguish discovery. They're not about selling. They're about discovery. So even somebody like Stephen Colbert, when he's interviewing Prince Harry, 
you could see the little piece of blue paper on his desk. It's an interview guide. So don't be afraid to have an interview guide. It doesn't mean you don't go off script. It doesn't mean you might not probe some areas more, some areas less, but you do have an interview guide. And we'll talk more about this, but I always recommend that you have a way to capture the interview. It could be through a Google form that you fill out or you have a colleague fill out while you're doing the interview, SurveyMonkey, Qualtrics. These are all methods of capturing. But I always recommend that there's two people doing the work. There's a scribe and someone who's recording, whether it's audio, video, physically recording, whatever. And then there's the person doing the interview, looking for the nonverbal cues, probing areas based upon those nonverbal cues and responses, uh, and not worrying about whether they wrote the right thing down or not. You're looking for creating questions about the biggest pain, the biggest anguish. Uh, is your customer base already creating some type of a hack? where they had to kludge together two or more different products in order to make the product that they want. Um, how do you capture that? What do you do to, to show how much maybe they're spending on their hack or how much anguish it takes to create the hack, uh, et cetera? Have they lost time, lost money, lost business because they had to either create a hack or have no solution to what it is that you believe is an opportunity in the market. If they already are using something, but they're not quite satisfied, is there one thing that's most important that they would change? That's always a great question. And of course, what do they like most and what do they like least about what it is that they're using now? Ideally, if you can do these interviews in the environment, um, that would be best. So when I worked on an industrial full-face respirator, the research was done out in factories with people who use uh, full-face industrial respirators, looking at their lockers, looking at their workspace, looking at how they clean the respirator. All of that research is important uh, before you create your MVP, your most uh, your minimum viable product. So uh, wrapping up here on the interview guide, think about what value this new product has. Probe on the value the reason to buy, uh, the reason to believe that that new product is gonna be better than anything else they've had. Probe on where and how they would buy it. It's online. Maybe it needs to be retail because they wanna sit in it, hold it, lift it, touch it, put it on if it's a piece of clothing. Um, and you, you always wanna ask, can you speak to others about the same problem? So for example, if you're working on a beach, and you have uh, a mother who goes to the beach frequently with the kids or uh, whoever's taking the kids to the beach, you want to understand if there's somebody like them or someone else they know that that person could refer you to so that you could do additional research and figure out if they know someone who takes the kids to the beach, uh, friend, family, whatever, and that you could interview them. In other words, Never let a lead die. If you don't feel like you have enough research, never let a lead die. And then remember, um, one of the questions is, are there specific areas tied to your product's unique value proposition that you wanna probe? Maybe yours is the lightest weight, the lowest cost, the fastest, the easiest to set up and deploy a beach tent, whatever. Um, so probe on those and probe the value of those and maybe even some type of economic value to address it. Okay, so I wanna play this abbreviated head talk from Simon Sinek, give me one moment. I'm gonna stop that share, make sure it's queued up.
why, how, what. This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. People don't buy what, they buy why. Friends would walk up to me so and be like, what, what in your mug? And I am trying to impress upon you is first understand the anguish in the market. So for example, with the beach tent, I use the example of, and I can't remember the statistics, you know, 30% of all of the people in the United States will end up with skin burn and or you know, skin cancer. We believe there is a way to change that with a comfortable, easy to set up beach tent that anyone can afford. So as an example, I want you to flip it so that your why is what comes first. With that, let me head back to the PowerPoint. Give me one moment, please. So three uh, interview phases. Phase one, discovery, no selling. Do not take your product out and pitch them on your product. No, when you do that, you will paint your market research. You will never get objective input. No selling, discover anguish. What is their big anguish? What causes them the most grief? Lost time, lost money, injuries in the workforce. Um, whatever it might be. Then phase two, an oral hypothesis. If there was a product or service, whatever, that could do X, Y, and Z, then probe on that. Would you find value in that? What would you like about it? What would you not like about it? Where would you expect to see it? You know, how would you buy it? Who would use it? Um, would there be training required? Whatever that might be, it's an oral hypothesis. Phase one and phase two, you're not really disclosing any detail that would allow, well, what the patent attorneys call reduction to practice. So it's been my experience, phase one and phase two don't require a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not an attorney. I can't give you legal advice. I can only tell you my experience. My experience is then, once you understand there is an opportunity, what is that opportunity? What could that product do? It answers the why, then it's time to build a prototype, an MVP, 
whatever you want to call it, and disclose it under a non-disclosure agreement. Capture that data, capture the use knowledge, capture the research in a way that allows you to create insights, which we'll talk about next. I'm going to skip this because we're I don't want to run out of time and I want to leave plenty of time. But there are benefits and drawbacks of ethnography. Ethnography is about doing research where you observe users in their environment and you're very careful not to taint that research with any bias. So in the user's environment, ideally observation first, private interview is always preferred with an end user. Um, group interviews, focus groups to the lesser extent. In focus groups, you often get group think or you get somebody to dominate the conversation. You may have a, a wallflower who doesn't give their opinion and that can be problematic. You wanna capture the uh, interviews, ideally video, audio second best, bring a scribe. You always wanna have someone else handling the recording, whether it's audio, video, or on a pad of paper or a tablet. I suggest somewhere around 10 questions, somewhere around 20 to 40 minutes. Prioritize your questions into maybe the top three to five questions, and then have secondary questions available depending on how it goes. But call it the must-have questions, nice-to-have questions. Um, make sure you understand the question logic. If they answer yes to this, then you need to branch to that. If they answer no to this, you can skip over and go to that. Make sure that's all laid out either through Qualtrics, SurveyMonkey, whatever, or just cleverly worded out in, in, in Microsoft Word or something. Um, interviewee compensation can be cash or gift card. I find Starbucks gift cards are pretty universal. Uh, that works well. So I want to pause for a second, open it back up. Um, and ask if there's any questions about customer discovery before we move on to a product market fit. Anyone have any anguish during doing their customer discovery work? A couple questions in the chat. Uh, breaking down the target market for volunteering. Senior citizens are interested or required to volunteer. So segmenting your market is very tricky, especially when you're doing customer discovery because you have a limited budget and a limited amount of time to research stakeholders. So think about which market segments are the best to go from concept to cash with the least amount of anguish in the shortest period of time. I hope that helps that question. Research, what is the end number of people needed to make a valid and reliable study? Um, I see often people use a statistical number of 30. Uh, when I've been doing some work at CSUN with the entrepreneurship students there, some of the best students are up over 100 interviews and they have incredible data and their pitch decks are incredibly compelling. And they may have had a couple pivots on the road between zero and 100. But you know, three or four is way too little. And I often find that three or four interviews is what it takes to refine the questions. So think about the first set of questions as a trial run. After you're through three or four, you tweak the questions, and then you go out for another round or two or three or four. But if your data is from a broad array of stakeholders, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but, and you're getting, let's say, 80% consistency across demographics. They like X and they don't like Y. That's great. But if you've got 30 interviews and the data is scattered, there is no one clear answer. Then you need to drop back then and punt, so to speak, and figure out if you've got a product that's going to be appealing to a broad enough audience to have a business. Hope that answers that question. Is there something we should be doing with our pivots? The answer is yes. I find a lot of times pivots can be used for downstream product or product improvements. 
So keep those pivots in your hip pocket. You may dust them off in the future. It may not be the right time to bring that product to market. It may be that the awareness set isn't there. You'll create the awareness set with your Gen 1, and then you'll have a pivot that you've abandoned. Maybe that gets dusted off or part of it for a Gen 2 product down the road. Okay, let's move back into product market fit. So now, understanding the market value, you're looking for the biggest pain, for the biggest insights. You're looking for persistence. Wow, I would buy that now. I'm going to open my wallet up. So for the Go Speak product, that portable PA, about 80% of the room said they would buy it tomorrow and pay up to $1,000 for it, as articulated verbally in that room that day. So that was great news. And then consistency is that 80%. So if you're getting numbers where 80% of the people are asking for the same thing, you've got some good numbers and worthy of moving forward. If that number is 20%, again, you may want to rethink what your offer is. Make sure that you are creating priorities for the product benefits. So. First of all, features versus benefit. The feature is a handle. The benefit is easy to carry. But a handle may not be important to somebody. So when you're doing your research, ideally, you're prioritizing the attributes of the product based upon the user's pain and needs, and if you can, willingness to pay. You want to interview and probe the priority of those pains, and you may be able to get out what I call Nice to haves versus must haves. If you can write a product specification that allows a developer to develop your product and differentiate between must have and nice to have, that would go a long way during development and managing the trade offs that will be inevitable during development. Consider tools to help you rank the data you've researched, force ranking where you um, have to literally force rank features, waiting, maybe you, you wait certain things, conjoint analysis, another technique that I'm not sure I'm gonna get into here, but there is a video uh, talking about it. Um, again, persistent and consistent responses. Uh, some people use a customer ladder, which identifies values, benefits, and features. Values being most important. Uh, benefits second and features least important. Features are just a method to deliver on a benefit. A benefit delivers on the value that the customer wants and, and values the most. Think about this concept of cash path as you narrow your product insights into a product specification. How does this all fit into your business strategy? Do you change your strategy? Do you change the product? Do you need a strategic partner? for development or for distribution, and then ultimately uh, managing the new product development project trade-offs. What trade-offs are you going to make based upon the insights you are able to capture during research? So I wanna talk just a little bit about some research tools. I created this, I call it the uh, New Product Development Project Pentagon framework. You've got five critical attributes when you're actually developing a physical product. And you're always wanting to look back at the research, customer discovery and product market fit that you've done as you manage these trade-offs. I have a whole other article that got published on this. And that is the feature set, which is, of course, speaking to the benefits, speaking to the values, the product cost, so hopefully you have a target cost that you know your development team is going to have to work towards. Your capital equipment cost, you may have limited funding and may have to have something that doesn't necessarily use a lot of capital equipment, maybe higher cost, but in the end, um, the product cost may be higher, the margins may be lower, but you can get into the market with lower capital investment. Your development engineering cost and your schedule. So for a moment on the topic of schedule, when I worked at Mattel Toys, 
the adage was always, Christmas never moves. You can't be late to Walmart. You can't tell them you'll be you know, two or three or four weeks late to Christmas. It doesn't work that way. And on the other hand, when I've done a lot of work in the medical product development world, there is no such thing as the schedule. It must be safe and effective. You can't deliver a product, quote unquote, on schedule that's not safe and effective. So understand downstream what the five critical attributes of your new product development project are looking like and how you can trade these off based upon the findings of your customer discovery and product market fit. Here's an example. It's a fictitious example. Using the stakeholder voice, you can prioritize and reallocate target cost dollars. So if you're going to trade off features versus product cost, so let's say there's a base product, the cost of it, manufacturing cost is a dollar, and you've got five different attributes you could trade off. The customers would like these, but they're ranked in this priority. Number one is the audible alarm all the way down through number five, battery powered versus let's say plug in the wall. You can see item number four, the status display, as a 32% of the product cost contribution, but its priority from the market is four. So the first thing you would do with that thing is cut it out. Cut out the status display. It would save a significant part of your target cost and the marketplace doesn't value it highly. I'm gonna skip over the conjoint analysis, but it'll be available in this deck. I recommend you do review and understand uh, how you can look at different testing of different product configurations to determine features and costs and sell price. And same thing with Cano, kind of the delighting aspects of a product versus the more functional product attributes that are required. Which ones delight the most? And if you have attributes that delight and they're relatively easy to develop and low cost in your product cost, those would be attributes of your product you'd like to prioritize. This is another technique, quality function deployment, where you list all the individual functions of the product and you can identify then the priorities thereof and determine how difficult they would be to develop, both in terms of schedule and development cost. So as a wrap, um, customer discovery and product market fit. Under customer discovery, you're gonna find the right users, create the interview guide, do the interviews. From that, you're gonna take the data, study what your product market fit is gonna look like. You'll interpret those results, ideally prioritizing features, benefits, and value from the market. You're gonna create the product insights, which turns into a technical product specification for development. And then through development, you will manage those trade-offs based upon what the market values the most. Keep that fidelity to the market. So thank you everybody for the opportunity to chat with you. Remember, 35% of all new startups that fail, fail because they delivered something to the market the market did not value. There is some bonus content in the deck, um, some Steve Blank content, some of the things I showed today, some specifics about surveys and interviews and interview guides, and some places to get further data. And with that, I will open it back up. First of all, Eric, thank you so much. Um, a great presentation with a lot of actionable detail. So those of you who are founders uh, listening to this workshop, whether you're on with us live today or watching this uh, sometime in the future, go out and do your market fit before you build. Please uh, take that time to figure out what that means because you will save everybody, including yourself, a lot of heartache. Uh, so let's open it up to some questions and see if anybody has anything that they'd like to ask Eric or the crowd. You I'm can unmute yourself. In, in hearing if anyone had challenges converting customer discovery into product market fit. Martin, how about you? 
are you still struggling with that product Martin product uh, market fit? Yes, this so, will be available. Uh -huh. so, Go ahead. So it's a it believe it or not, it's a tough question to answer, right? Uh, because it appears that people are looking for this product. It it appears that people have actually spent money with us on this product. And yet um, we have had a group of people that have taken appointments with us and it ends up where they ghost us, which is not unusual in education. Um, that education is known for that, which is they never reply if it's something they're not interested in. Well, are they actually the buyers? Yes. Or are they only the influencers in the purchase decision? No, actually they're the buyers. So they're the buyers, but they're not the customer. Right. Right. So the, the challenge is the customer is the end user. And unless you get the parents of the kids excited about wanting to use the product, the people who actually are going to purchase the product are never going to do it because they don't see that excitement. So you you have to you have to go a layer down, Mark. Your 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 customer discovery is not the people who are purchasing your product. They're the people using your product and then building that groundswell. So they go back to the people who actually purchase and say, we want this product. Can you get it for us? So to Len's point, understanding the purchase path is important so that when you're doing your customer discovery, you know the difference between the end user and what I call the gatekeeper. So, so, so I, I understand that. Okay, great. So I've, I've been in education for 20 years. Oh, okay. And I don't know that school districts actually listen to parents. It's embarrassing to say, but they don't, right? Everything is done through um, curriculum and instruction as far as purchasing products. Um, this product is slightly different because it is not subject uh, subject specific. So it's not math, English, or uh, geography. It is preparing kids for the workforce. And that that is a very big deal. Uh, in listening to all the politicians that you talk to, that you listen to, I, I was listening to uh, Chris Christie yesterday on CNN. He talked about it. Uh, a whole bunch of other politicians talk about it, and schools just don't seem to care. I think that's the bottom line. So do you know about the Mike Rowe Foundation? No. So the guy who is the star of the TV show Dirty Jobs has a foundation where he funds lots of different activities to help kids get jobs that the economy needs that are not available uh, you know, through academic college education. Right. Whether it's plumbing, electrical, you know, horse groomer, whatever it might be. Um, the Mike Rowe Foundation, the guy who found who was the star of the TV show Dirty Jobs, he might be a resource. The other question I was going to ask you is, what about PTA, you know, parent teacher associations? So, so, so it's interesting you say that that is our pivot. Oh. So our pivot is that and um, uh, going to um, uh, continuation schools. Yeah. who are not sending kids to college because uh, they would have a greater uh, stake in um, understanding what the um, cognitive skills of these students are and what programs they need to make them successful for the next step in life. Oh. And, and, you know, and, and quite honestly, I feel like I'm almost embarrassed when I say um, educators don't care it sounds like sour grapes to me, and and I don't mean I don't mean to be disrespectful, um, because I know that they have a lot on their plate. It just seems that this makes so much sense to prepare so students. So sixty six percent of students in community college and college actually have jobs as they're going through their education as well as the third of the students that go directly into the workforce after high school graduation. 
So let's, this, hear, let's hear from let's hear from Len. Len, go ahead. Please, I'm sorry. So, so a couple of things, Martin, that come to mind. We'll take your uh, company as a test case. Uh, Please to talk about um, the decision making in school district is not robust. It's ancient, archaic, and as Karen said, takes years to get through. And you you said something. The educators, um, you know, this is not their focus. They're they're focused on educating kids. The people who make the decision of what school district spends money on is the school board elected people. Those are the people you need to get to be your advocates because they're the ones that can influence a school district to set aside money for workforce development if they think it's important enough. So, so that's, a, that's a good point, and I have not done that. Instead of going to the superintendent of school, the principal, whose real focus is the day-to-day -day education of the kid not long-term outcome because they don't have the luxury of long-term outcomes. They're, they're stuck in the day-to-day -day operations, wrong people to sell to. So as you've already pivoted to, whether it's to a PTA or going to outside groups that are, are focused on workforce development, like the Boys and Girls Club, like the scouting organizations or other youth focuses that have workforce development built into their programs, would be a better selling point than trying to go through school districts. And, you know, I, I've, I've seen lots of um, programs and companies that are trying to do what you're doing, maybe not in the workforce development, but in other areas that is not related to reading, write, writing, and arithmetic. And that's just not going to go anywhere because the school district bureaucrat, the employees, have a prescribed function to, to follow. And anything outside of that, they're disinterested in. It's going so to fall on deaf ears. Len, I want to hitchhike on that, which is understand your stakeholders' motivation yep. and how they are measured, right? So I know a lot of those that have been in academia and how they're measured in the high school is what percentage of their students go on to college? Exactly right. So you are unlikely to change that measure through interviewing academics right and and this this concept of understanding how people are measured your stakeholders are measured what's in it for them what motivates them what lights up their heart what increases their wallet size it's those motivations during customer discovery and product market fit you want to keep in mind and especially up front when you're identifying users to interview so the the broad based comment Martin, about how your situation applies everybody in the Zoom room. It's about what motivates those stakeholders and be aware of that because it may not be articulated. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else with a different case? I, I, I'm going to, since there's no questions, I'm going to illustrate one company that came through the pre-accelerator that, um, could have avoided 18 months of lost resources and time uh, because they came with their product built as an app to increase liquor store purchasing online uh, and delivery, competing with Drizzly, Saucy, et cetera. And this, was, this company was founded by a liquor store owner who had the problem of too much technology sitting on their counters and not enough deliveries being fostered through the relationships. And he thought he could build a better mousetrap. Instead of going out and asking everybody if they actually needed a better mousetrap, he just built it. And what he found is he had the same traction everybody else did in alcohol delivery and it wasn't enough. And nor was he ever going to compete with Uber. So their pivot was, well, let's eliminate the technology on the counter get it down to one laptop, provide a SaaS platform that incorporates all the other technological issues corner, corner convenience stores and liquor stores don't have and provide that and disrupt that industry. And that was their pivot. That company's called Bev's. They're, in, they're, they're taking on companies month over month now at a high rate and they're delivering their product. And it's, they had to go through that customer fit after they built their first product. And that's not what we want to see people do. Great story, thank you, Len. 
Chris, go ahead, Chris. Hey, I just had something I wanted to say to Martin. Uh, Martin, I've been trying to get into school districts for a long time too, and it's just the most frustrating thing ever because there's so much levels of management there. And in sports, um, technically, I should be going to the athletic director. And every time you meet the athletic director, these guys don't want to make a decision or have their name placed on any product that they came through that they have to have a signature on. However, where I fairly found the loophole is if I go into a team or a school and say, I want to be a sponsor for you, what's the minimal level of sponsorship? Then it's, the, it's completely flipped around. You're like royalty. You want to bring money in there. And they say, all right. Well, here's our deal on it. They actually have a very prescribed deal for how they sponsor stuff. And then your name is and your product is immediately associated with that school and they almost endorse it. So you get this and then you can market and pitch it directly to the parents, almost with the school's um, OK or approval or endorsement. And that's just something that I found that I use to get into the schools. And when I walk into the games, everybody knows my name You're and I have a banner up on the gym. So they know who I am and they um, wave to me and the kids all know my name. And uh, that was my way to get into school districts. That's great. Thank you for that. Sure. You're Looks welcome. like uh, Karen, you've been very helpful in your chat. Um, I know you're not on screen. That's fine. Is there something, Karen, you'd like to share with us about your uh, situation? Her, her camera, her camera came on, but she's not in it. <laughs> there she is. You're, we can't hear you, Karen. Your you, your microphone's not working. All right. While that's under while that's underway. Lorana, welcome. I think you just joined us. We're just wrapping up, but uh, we'd love to hear from you if you want to share a little bit about your venture or your thoughts for customer discovery and product market fit. Lorana? Oh, I, I actually did listen to the presentation. Thank you. I had to hop off and I'm I'm just popping back in to, to get the tail end of this. <laughs> oh, thank you. And is there something that uh, brought you to this session today in particular? Yes. So I am an investor and I, and I am affiliated with an accelerator here in LA. And this is just a um, an area where a lot of entrepreneurs, they just kind of skip it. They have validation otherwise, whether it be family, friends, or maybe they've raised a little bit of money. But in terms of boots on ground, getting out there and figuring this out, the customer discovery and the product market fit, I, I have seen a lot throw in the towel because of this very topic. And so I was interested in coming here and getting this perspective. So thank you. My pleasure. So the deck will be available to you. Lorana, when you talk about them throwing in the towel, are they throwing in the towel after a significant after investment or early? Um, uh, it depends on how you define significant investment. <laughs> um, in, in the six figures, yeah. Um, just and then I've also seen entrepreneurs where they can't get out of that kind of that product development loop to get out and actually test if what they are building does make sense because they're just so focused on all these iterative steps with the product, the product, the product. Um, and for me to try to get them to go out sometimes is, is, a, is a battle. So um, let's see, is my client still in the room? No, it looks like Ben dropped off. I, oh, Ben, I think, Karen, I, I think Karen's, uh, oh, Karen's on. working. Yeah. Karen, are you on? Can you unmute? Yeah. Am I on? Can you hear me? No, you're echoing. So you've got two microphones open. Uh, I'll come back. Yeah. Hey, Ben, do you want to comment about your experience so far with the customer discovery and work you're doing to do it up front? Hey, Eric, can you hear me okay? Yes. It's a little noisy in my area. Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think right now, um, you know, we're kind of getting some questions together. Um, I think that's been... Kind of a struggle um i mean initially of course with your help i can uh, feel like i have a north a good north star now um, but i think it's just kind of getting the right headset of kind of those questions to ask um understanding um how to keep it simple right and really glean what that anguish is so i'm excited you know definitely um you know uh there's a lot more to uh, uncover and um but I really appreciate this presentation. I always uh, really love 
kind of hearing perspectives, of course, of others as well. So thanks for uh, inviting me. Absolutely. I look forward to continuing our work in customer discovery and product market fit. Karen, how about you? Or, or is it Carrie? Yeah, I, I, I go by both. Um, I, I went to USC and I was in a, a business development program. And one of my, I wanted to build a volunteer system, but my professor, oh, sorry about my dog. My professor wanted me to build an internship program. And he said, if I develop this internship program and get it approved by these many people that he'll make sure I have funding for it. I was on that for years and I wasted years. I mean, even with the endorsement of everyone, um, it, I was just running in circles. So I can really attest how hard it is, even when I brought it to other educational systems, even with the endorsement uh, of a product that they requested, it, it's crazy making. In that environment. In that environment. I mean, educational systems are just not where you want to spend your money and time for all the reasons you mentioned, Martin. But I wish, I wish you good luck because I know that they need better products and services. There's just no decision maker. There's no clear, there's no clear supply chain path. It keeps changing every time you turn around. Yeah, I think uh, to Len's point, you have to go elsewhere, whether it's a you know, school board, uh, the Micro Foundation, um, there may be private uh, or, or NGOs that are out there that get some government funding and are looking for a unique value proposition for their business. And maybe, Martin, that's your, your, your path in. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just, uh, and also, I just looked up the uh, Mike Grow Foundation and I have a phone number. And we will use a lot, utilize that. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how easy it is to get in, but he's got a big presence in that space. You know, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince. <laughs> very true. All right. Eric, I want to thank you very much for your time, your effort, your presentation, the work you put into it, and uh, the years of knowledge that you were able to condense down to an hour. Uh, it's always brilliant when people are able to do that. And I want to thank everybody who came on today to listen to you. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. And Eric, do you have any last words? No, feel free to reach out to me. I'm available on LinkedIn, Eric Paul Rose. Um, and my website is pinnaclepi.com. All right. If thank I can just all. say one thing, I, I, I appreciate all of the attention you've given us. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free to whenever reach out. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody whenever, in the room. Whenever somebody's willing to step up and uh, be uh, a little bit vulnerable, it works out really well. So thank you for doing that, guys. Appreciate it. If you never ask, you never get, right? Yeah. Amen. That's a for sure.